This is Keys to the Shop, episode 400, The Values of Speed and Service with Jamie Denny of Scooter's Coffee. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I'm your host for the show. Always happy to have you here. If you can subscribe to the show, that would be wonderful. All you need to do is hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this show. You'll always be updated with new episodes as they come out. Average about 10 episodes per month with the shift break episodes, the short format ones on Thursdays, these full length episodes on Tuesdays. And then we have specials like Coffee Fest Live. We've got Founder Fridays rate of rise. There's a lot to keep up with this whole universe of uh, topics and content. So being subscribed is a really good idea. And also it would be awesome if you would share these episodes with your friends and your team, especially if you would share on social media, on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever, about Keys to the Shop. There's so many people running great coffee shops around the world and people who need to be inspired and need the content of our guests and the topics we cover to really enhance their operations. So that goes a long way to spread the love. Thank you, everybody. Now, Keys to the Shop is not just a podcast, although a considerable amount of my time is spent on the podcast, but it's also a consulting and coaching company. So Keys to the Shop Consulting is all about helping you bring your operations, people, and quality to the next level, helping you solve problems in your coffee shop, navigate challenges, bring your existing operations to scale. There's a lot of clients I'm working with right now who are successful operators looking to make the next step in their business or people who are really just starting their first coffee shop and need an advisor along that path. So again, this is one-on-one with myself, coaching and consultation. That's the heart of Keys to the Shop Consulting. And I'd love to have a conversation with you. If you'd like to set up a free discovery call with me, go ahead and email chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. We'll talk all about what's going on with your business, what your needs are, and how Keys to the Shop Consulting can help. Again, for more information, email chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, I just got back from Coffee Fest in New York City, and one of the great parts about that is I get to see friends in the industry doing great things, and one of those people is the Ground Control Crew. Groundcontrol.coffee is their website. They are the makers of the Cyclops Brewer, and this brewer is basically taking the world by storm. It is the next generation and the next level of what you can expect from batch brewing. It uses SCA, award-winning technology, to give you control over the extraction of such a range and depth of flavor in your coffee, truly making it a differentiator for your coffee bar and helping your coffee really just reach its full potential. Not only this, but its extraction technology allows you to make tea, batched iced lattes, batched cold brew. So it increases your profitability and workflow at the same time. So Again, check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee. And for a limited time now, they are running a special 50% off the Ground Control Brewer. And so if I were you, I'd get to their website and check that out while supplies last. It is a great deal on what I believe to be the best brewer you could possibly get for your cafe. I really think that if you're looking for quality, a level up in workflow, a conversation piece, and just, you know, offering your customer the next level of what coffee can taste like. Getting a ground control Cyclops brew in your store is a great idea. Check them out again over at groundcontrol.coffee. Another element of Coffee Fest that I was involved with was head judge for Coffee Fest Latte Arts. It's the uh, Coffee Fest Latte Art World Championship Open. It's been going for 20 years now. That's two decades of, of pouring drinks. And, you know, one of the things we do in the middle of that round is we do a plant-based round and it's sort of a fun round we do between competition rounds and that is featuring our amazing friends over at pacific foods in their barista series line of plant-based performance beverages the barista series was designed specifically for the standards of professional baristas and each of the lineup of plant-based beverages in the barista series is tested by some of the world's best baristas before it even makes it onto your counter to serve your guests that's why it stands up to the heat from steaming 
produces awesome silky texture and why the flavor is actually focused on the coffee. So it's a perfect match for your customers and your coffee. And that's all by design. Check them out at pacificfoodservice.com and get samples of the barista series in your store. Try it for yourself. If you're looking for the best quality to serve your customers, then I highly recommend you use the barista series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. Well, today I'm really honored to be talking with uh, our guest today. We're talking with Jamie Denny, who is the vice president of franchise operations for Scooters Coffee. You know the brand. They have been expanding. They are especially in the middle of the country. I know I've got a few here in Louisville. And if you're in the middle of the country, especially you see them popping up and maybe you have questions like what's the deal? What's the story? What's the, you know, especially how does this thing operate? And today is your day because these are the things we are going to be talking about with Jamie Denny. Jamie Denny joined Scooters Coffee as the vice president of franchise operations in November of 2022 to focus on initiatives aimed at increasing the speed and effectiveness of the drive through service. She is a highly energetic and passionate results oriented operations leader, has a proven track record of achievement in the quick serve restaurant industry. Jamie has a lot of experience leading large cross-functional teams, delivering business results and implementing food service solutions. And prior to joining Scooters Coffee, Denny was the vice president of brand operations for Jamba, where she worked cross-functionally with teams to drive franchise operational excellence and deliver quality training and support. And she helped successfully migrate Jamba to a new POS system and implemented digital enhancements to set franchisees up for success during COVID. And in her 15 years of coffee industry experience, she's also held leadership roles with Starbucks, Tropical Smoothie Cafe, and Aramark. And so we're talking with somebody who has deep knowledge of, like we mentioned, like cross-functional teams and working together to help large-scale operations achieve consistency and speed within a brand's values and goals. And these are things that I think we could greatly benefit from listening to because we as mostly, I think, with Keys to the Shop, we've got larger companies who listen to the show. We've got a lot of independent coffee shop operators who are the base of what Keys to the Shop is about. But you've heard it on the show before when we interviewed Major Cohen from Starbucks and others with larger operations like Big B Coffee. There is a lot to learn from the larger scale operations. And if we just cut ourselves off from learning from those folks, then I think we do ourselves a disservice. And so that's why I'm really excited to you know, interview Jamie today to learn a little bit more about what the secret sauce is, if you will, for the operations of Scooter's Coffee. So we're going to be talking a lot about training for management. We're going to talk about site selection. We're talking about what it looks like culturally inside of Scooter's and what goes into how they decide on certain menu items and what that means for speed of service, especially we talk about their values of speed and how that balances with quality of life for the people who are actually working in scooters and how they achieve consistency in their operations to make good on their core values at such a large scale. At the time of this recording, I think what I saw was 613 locations and they're continuing to expand And I think there's a lot to learn here. And I'm privileged again to get an opportunity to talk with Jamie on the show. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation and learn a lot. Without anything else from me, let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with the Vice President of Franchise Operations for Scooters, Jamie Denny. All right, Jamie Denny, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing great, doing great. I am excited to have you on the show, and I know that there's so much to talk about regarding scooters and coffee and operations, and you've just got a rich history in operations and in coffee, and so I wanted to kind of start off just exploring a little bit about your career in coffee. I know that you've been doing this for quite a long time, but how did this career for coffee develop, and then I guess specifically where did it start to like really focus in on operations of cafes and and coffee operations? Yeah, well, first I'll talk about how I started in operations. And that was actually just right out of college. So I started with a great organization in Texas and 
And it was a management program that they took me through. And I'll tell you, they did a fantastic job. And that is where I fell in love with anything operational. <laughs> I discovered a passion for process, for people, and really just for customers in general, just that interaction and that time with people. So I consider myself really fortunate to have found what I really like doing at an early age. How did you fall in love with it? What was it about it? Was it just like serving people? Was it the idea of everything kind of coming together for an experience that somebody has? What was that like magic moment <laughs> for you, if you will? <laughs> well, there's really two. One is when you when you think about process, my passion is how to make a process easier for the people that you work with. But really, when you see it just pay off for the customer, right, and your team and you are like, yes, we we did that, right? We figured out something. And I like to say there's a lot of problems sometimes perceived out there, and we like to solve problems. That's sort of my standing mantra. And that is really what I fell in love with is really when you bring a team together and you're focused together on what can we do best for our customers and they're leaving with a smile and we know we've done it all right. And it's just that high five moment at the end of the day where you're just like, wow, we, we crushed it. We did that. And how do we continue to make that better? Right. And so that's really where I fell in love with operations and just that problem solving process, people type of thought. So problem solving, when I hear you talking about, hey, we did that, let's keep making it better. In my mind, and I've told people on the show before, our role as operators is to not waste problems and but not to repeat the same problems <laughs> say like have new failures in the future is great and old failures having to be repeated is not so great yeah. when you look at the end of the day and you say well how can we make this better i'm sure there's some element of like introducing operational standards that bring you up to the next level of like baseline based on those experiences how did that develop for you where you started to take those problems and challenges and turn them into like institutional solutions? I think really what we focused on or what I focused on in my career is there's always this standard line of standard operating procedures, right? And so it's how do we take that and, and I like to refer to it as continuous improvement. So how are we continuing to make that better? How are we continuing to level up? And the most exciting part of being an operator for me is what I like to call when I have an operator that quote unquote earns the right to play outside of the standard operating procedure box. So for example, there if you imagine in your head, there's a box and these operators are just so good and they can they just have their own vision for, for where to go and it falls right in line with the standards. And when you give them permission, right, you give them the keys to keep going and don't wait for me. Clearly, you know where you're going take it and run. Let's see what you can do. When you give people those opportunities, they really do wow you in a lot of ways, right? And so it's just been a great journey for me to, one, I love operating procedures in general, but I love solving good problems. And I love when people, and it's a small percentage of folks who really take on personally this challenge of, I want to do more. And when you give them that permission to do it, oh my gosh, it's amazing. You can just crush through and you, you really do get to that next level. So then it's not about continuous improvement. It's about we have crushed it and there's a whole new standard that we're going to put in place. Yeah. So there's the people who take up the challenge, I guess, of business. And it feels like there's a lot of people who, most people I would say, are looking to play outside the operational box because that feels like where life happens, where you're not just learning music theory, you're improvising, but you're still obeying the rules of music theory, I guess. And so what is the characteristic of somebody who is more likely to embrace operational standards and earn that right or the opportunity to go outside the box, I guess is mm -hmm. the terminology we're using here, but what is the common characteristic? Is it just that they're wanting to do more or is it something else? No, I think it's one, they have a true passion. And that's critical. If you if you care about it, but it's not a passion for you, that makes a difference. And when you're truly passionate and you just that all you do all day long is figure it out and really work hard at it. And, and for a lot of people, you can tell when they have the vision and, and when they don't. So a lot of people really want to do well, to your point, right? They want to meet the standards. They want to do better than the standards. And they really thrive in that environment. But there's this rare group 
of individuals who just have this vision and for whatever they they can just see where they are going and I can't see it necessarily I just support it <laughs> mm. which is I think the most fun is to watch someone do this on their own and give them the freedom to do so and maybe ask questions challenge Maybe I offer a more strategic viewpoint sometimes. Sometimes they can get mired in the weeds. And so it's just developing that relationship with someone where they can take their vision and they can test drive it on you, or you give them the permission to test it out and then you check in. So what worked, what didn't work, right? Again, that, that thought process of continuous improvement. And I've been so fortunate to work with some leaders that just are stellar and have done a t- it's just a tremendous job. They wow me. <laughs> There's yeah. no other way to say it, Chris. They just are truly... Um, they're wow individuals. So when we're talking about those individuals, obviously now you've got this, a Scooters has over 600 locations mm-hmm. and we're not going to have every person be exactly that person, right? And so like all the people that work at all the stores, there's going to be varying levels of entry. Like people are just learning the ropes and other people are really taking the initiative. And it sounds like those people who are taking the initiative in ways that are above and beyond maybe, or that passion are improving the systems to help those who, you know, maybe coffee isn't a career for them necessarily, but it's, they can benefit from the systems. How do you capture the wowing, uh, turn it into something that benefits people who are a great people and great employees, but they're, they're not necessarily operating at that level nor should they, they're, you know, accomplishing what needs to be accomplished. So how do you capture that and put it into systems? Well, one, I always capture best practices and share it back out with the system. Two, if it's that great, it becomes the norm or the standard operating procedure. But the third thing, and this is really critical for me, Chris, is your best opportunity is to let a peer talk to a peer and really share why this is so great that we took this position, right? Or that this is the best practice that now should just become the standard operating procedure. I can do it all on my own, but it's not going to be the same as if someone from the level that we're talking about, for example, a store manager telling a store manager, there's just a difference. When you have someone who's super passionate, they figured out a problem and they really just want to share it with others and they want to show them, that right there, that's when you're really working with something magical. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And it becomes, well, I say, I don't want to use the term viral, but there it goes. Yeah. Just did. (laughs) And, and, (laughs) you know, it really is a culture thing, right? And that's how culture is allowed to flourish and curated and it can't be forced necessarily. So that's a great point. So all of this experience with your past roles and having these kind of experiences with other people that have wowed you. Now you've been with Scooters. I think, you know, you came on to Scooters last year. Is that correct? Uh, in November. In November. Yeah. And so I'm curious about your role and your goals in that role and what you're bringing from those experiences to Scooters that you're really hoping like, hey, let's take these experiences and apply them to this you know, already obviously successful company, but how are you hoping to enhance that? A couple of things I'd say. One, Scooters is so impressive with their dedication to speed of service, and most importantly, their dedication to really creating the best work environment for their baristas. And when I say that, what I mean is operationally, the entire setup is geared towards making it easy to be a barista, making it easy for a barista to actually serve a customer, right? So everything that they have in mind is how fast is X machine? Is X machine located within a, as an example, if I'm building a beverage, is everything I'm doing working down the line towards the customer, right? That's the important part. And and how fast can it work? right? So how fast can we make all of those things happen? Because again, we're known for speed. And so the amazing part is really just watching just this hyper focus inside the organization, but also inside the kiosks and watching the baristas just continue to focus on how how they can improve their speed to really where we like to say there's a hanger, right? There's a barista at the window in the morning who literally is holding your coffee as you drive up. Now, imagine that experience and what that's going to feel like, Chris. It feels amazing. Like, wow, I just ordered that and you already have it ready. Like, one, you're respecting my time. But two, this is going to taste delicious. And I'm so excited. Look at this. The coffee was ready for me. I'm ready to go. So it's just that change of the day. And so 
from other organizations I've worked at, that's been a focus is how do I sell people on that thought? And this organization is already here. So my efforts are going to be around how do we, one, again, offer continuous improvement. Just because the majority of the kiosk and the equipment and everything works great doesn't mean there's still not room for more improvement or room to get better and to think about how we drive additional sales. But it's also thinking about for the baristas, how can they help us problem solve that? And how can we work with our franchisees and with our corporate stores to bring those best ideas forward that's going to pay off for the customer? That's great. And so enhancing the service and enhancing the speed and creating that experience for the baristas, I'm curious about that because when we hear about, okay, let's kind of always problem solve faster, faster, in our minds, I feel like I'm white knuckling a uh-huh. steering wheel, right? And so for most of us thinking about that, we're like, yeah, but you know what's going to happen is we're going to suffer. Like baristas are going to get stressed out. They're going to burn out. And is it speed at all costs? How do we balance that with quality of life and all that stuff? So when you mentioned it's easy to be a barista there and you have a great workflow and I appreciate everything toward the customer is <laughs> something I tell my clients all the time when uh-huh. we're, we're talking about design. But designing the operations also, so we have workflow, right? So being a barista in a fast-paced environment where speed is a value, how do you counterbalance the inevitable thought that maybe a barista would have is, and this is not maybe something that is a problem for you all, but I would think, hey, if it's not fast enough, I'm going to be cut. I'm done. Speed at all costs, even if we have to like go through a bunch of people to do it. How do you balance that? So I think there's two ways. The first is deployment and being really clear and intentional about where all those different deployment positions are. Just because you might not be great, for example, at the espresso machine doesn't mean you're not great at the window, right? So it just depends on the person, I guess I would say, but it's also for us as an organization being really clear about where can we go and what deployment positions are we looking at? And so we've expanded, for example, into looking at two additional roles in the system. So one being a quarterback. So imagine this being the person that is is not necessarily making any of the beverages, but they can see up and above and they're looking for where are those opportunities that I can coach and help in order to make sure that we're maintaining that speed and or maybe we're just trying to break new records, right? So how am I encouraging this along to make sure that we're breaking those records and or just really making sure that the team is having a great time doing it? And the second thing I'd say is to your question, it would go back to the menu and being really intentional as an organization about the menu. We want to offer our customers the best drinks. We have amazing drinks and we're amazingly fast. But the thing we keep in mind all of the time is what's really on that menu board. And are we offering our best sellers? Are we offering the things that our customers love? And we're certainly open to customization. We know that's out there in the marketplace. But we also know that if you try it the way we've made it or we've offered it up as a beverage, you're going to love it. So I think we just really stay very intentional on making it easy at the menu, making it easy for customers to make whatever changes they'd like. But we're not really going to go all in on that like other organizations have. We're going to stay pretty simple and honest to our core qualities and our core values. And speed as in a way of honoring somebody's time is manifest in that way where if you did embrace the full customization of other businesses, you would inevitably be sacrificing speed. Yes. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it's also maybe not the beverage that we intended. (laughs) The drink is not necessarily what it was intended to be. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like a customer will create their own drink and then they're going to blame blame you for the the result. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) And it took so long for you to do like, you know, quarter ounce of 17 things. I can't believe it. (laughs) And how do you make sure people are having a good time doing that? I mean, I know that there's simplicity that equals a lot less stress on my mind that someone's going to throw me this curveball necessarily, and maybe less so here than other places. But in terms of making sure that everyone's having a good time doing this, how does that happen? We have um, HME timers in our stores. And what this is, it's literally a visual of a car coming around the kiosk. We find that a lot of our baristas are fairly competitive. And so when they see the car turn possibly yellow and possibly red from any point at the menu board where they place their order and then in the six car stack that leads to the window, they really get a little worried. So it's almost this sense of 
pride for the team to really, how do we reduce that? And, and oh my gosh, did you notice we had, guys, we had three cars turn red, what are we gonna do, right? Where's the bottleneck, what happened and how can we solve the problem right here in the moment? And again, it's not the intent to stress out, it's the intent of where did we see that little hiccup and what happened? And what do we do that next time to make sure that we, we do things differently? So that's, I think sometimes as we continue to grow, the quarterback position itself is gonna become even more important. That one person that can level up, and, and I call it helicoptering up, right? They can helicopter up and they can see over and really look to see, all right, I can see a, a little tweak over here, a little tweak over there on different pieces of the engine and where the baristas are placed and how do I make that better? And that's that effort that they can really make happen. And I think the other part too is, you know, we've really embraced line busting, right? So I have all of these customers and I have a standard queue but gosh, what if I want to continue to drive more? What if I want to really prove to my store team and myself that we can make this happen? What if we go out and we go beyond the menu and we start taking cars that are waiting behind that and we show them how fast we are? That continues to build trust. That continue Coffee is a loyalty business. You hear our co-founder, co-founder Don Eccles say it all the time. Coffee is a loyalty business. And when you have a customer who is loyal, meaning they love your coffee, and they love your speed and they trust you, they will come back every day to get that call and to get that experience that they've had in your drive through One thing that I think about is consistency. And loyalty is not only based on speed, but it's also based on the fact that if you get it fast, it's great. But if I get it the same, it's even greater. Obviously, with great service, that's also true. But how do you ensure consistency across so many baristas and even, I would say, so many leaders, because leaders who want to make all of these tweaks, they have to make these tweaks according to an ethos that translates down the line to still having consistency across the company. And with over 600 locations, it just sounds monumental. So what does consistency engineering look like for uh, scooters? Well, it's back to the standards and ensuring that everyone has the standards and is aware of them, but it's also back to creating that relationships. And it's what do our, when we go in as a franchise business consultant team or our boundless operations team, or if you're a franchise operator and your district manager is going into a store and your store manager is there, what you think about is what are they focused on? And there's what you're focused on at peak, and then there's what you're focused on post-peak. And really ensuring that we all have the same lens that we're looking through. And one of the things we introduced last year that I'm really excited about, Chris, and we've had this at a former organization I worked at too, is, is really what we call the go see. So here you do a great job. You really trust your team. You know you can be better. You're putting things into place, like maybe investing in a quarterback role or you're investing in line busting. Now you really want to take it to the next level. And what we're encouraging owners and above store leaders to do is take a step back and during that peak time frame, go watch, right? Watch and see what are the customer's behavior for your particular store and what is, what is the barista doing? What are those little nuances of things that we can notice and see? Now, when you're completing a go see, the whole trick is do not go coach because it is so, <laughs> well, you really feel the need to like, I got to get in there. But the real trick is to stay true to observation for a period of time. And when I say a period of time, it's 30 minutes or more. We really want you writing down observations. So for example, we give you a stopwatch, we tell you to hit the stopwatch, we have tools that you can use where you fill in the information, and we ask you to analyze at the menu, what's happening at the menu. Are we seeing maybe, for example, is the person that's on the headset and the customer that's at the menu, are we having too many interactions back and forth? It, maybe the person that's uh, taking the order is a little bit distracted. Maybe they're trying to multitask and they're not fully focused on taking in the order, as an example. That would be something that during a, you can make the assumptions everybody's doing a great job, but during a go-see, those are those things, Chris, that just kind of bring themselves, they bubble up and they bubble to life. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I see it. Now I know I can coach it differently. Because in the heat of the battle, it kind of maybe escapes you. But when you take that moment and you take that opportunity to really dial into your business and you go-see and you give yourself 
I don't know, almost permission to not coach, but to just sit back and observe and see what you can find. It really does make all the difference. Yeah. And I love that point. And it's something I completely agree with is don't try to, you know, superman the thing and, and mm-hmm. you're not going to really solve a systematic issue by, you know, chastising or coaching somebody in the moment because it's not going to disseminate to actual systems. What you're talking about reminds me of like the Toyota production system with Gemba Kaizen and the... That is exactly is that right. That's exactly yeah. <laughs> where it kind of distills from. Yes, exactly. And for those who don't know, I mean, it's Gemba is just... It means to take a walk, to see what's happening on the floor. And yeah, obviously there's a lot of patience that has to be at play and faith in the system that if you do observe these things, you're not just going to like forget them. Like you as the owner are going to have to follow through with the observations that you actually make. And that takes a certain kind of personality, right? Mm -hmm. A certain type of person to run something like this. Because all the qualifications that you've kind of been talking about this whole time, these are exceptional qualities that lead to success. So it kind of leads me to want to know how the franchising process works in terms of selecting people who will become owners of scooters. Is there an application process that kind of seeks out these qualities that will you know they'll be more likely to take these tasks on in full? How does that work? Yeah, there's a lot that goes into looking at a, someone who is interested in franchising. And what it really boils down to is what's your day-to-day, what's your level of commitment that you'd like to make to the day-to-day operation? And for scooters, that is the piece that's going to make the difference. Because trust me, these are folks that are looking to invest their life savings or they want to be their own boss and they want to have a business. They're entrepreneurial. They want to go explore that. They don't want to work for someone else. And all of those are great traits, but if, if you plan to manage from afar, that's very different than managing this business, which does require that you manage it more up close. Yes. And up close is putting it lightly because it's not a big space. No, it's 664 <laughs> square feet. <laughs> and I mean, again, you know, it's a drive through, it's speed. It's also, you know, when we're talking about leadership, a lot of our leadership is based, and I'm talking mainly about like brick and mortar, independent type of businesses. And a lot of listeners fall into that category. We've got the office, we've got the trappings, we've got the stuff. Now, I don't think there's really room for an office in the building, is there? No, there's not. So, <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's a carved out space that is essentially a larger block that has been left on a <laughs> storage rack. And that's where, that's where quote unquote, you can set up your laptop and maybe have a chair, but it does need to be a folding chair so it can get moved out of the way. How can you manage, Jamie, with this? I mean, I, how can I be expected to lead? Absolutely. You don't need a big space to make that happen. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, that's really what it boils down to is you do have that workspace. And look, when we're in the peak moment, so many of our owners and leaders, they're in it. They're in it during that peak moment, right? So Monday through Friday, that's 6.30 to 10.30. Saturdays and Sundays are a little bit different because people are out. They're generally together as a family, right? So you're ordering more as a full car and doing those types of things. And it's a little bit later in the day. But you have a pretty consistent business standard, right? Where you know where your peaks are coming and what you're doing. And so save all those activities that you need to get done from managing till after the peak. And that's when you really have a little bit more space, a little bit more time. You can move that laptop around and and you can sit down and get what you need to get done. Okay. Now, the whole idea of having this kind of an experience at scale is, at the face of it, daunting. It didn't start as this giant operation. So I'm kind of a little bit interested in how opportunities are pursued for expansion and In light of knowing what the values are and the kind of experience you want staff to have and customers to have, it's a lot of people's opinion. I think that rapid expansion or the kind of expansion that maybe we see scooters doing would be a detriment to ensuring those kinds of experiences. And so maybe enlighten us a little bit about how scooters goes about making decisions on market expansion, like where to go, how many stores to open and why. I think what I would have you think about, Chris, is really how are we going to translate the success in other markets? And I'll tell you what brought me to Scooters. Part of what brought me here is not just the expansion piece, because we're going to continue to expand at a rapid rate. We know 
where we are right in the middle of the country is right where we should be, right? That is our customer. That's where the scooters customer is. But here's what I love about this organization is just the true commitment to training. So once you get through this entire process of becoming, you're going to sign a franchise agreement, you've come through the processes, we've we've all decided we're going to go do business together, and now you're in the system, right? And so then you've got kind of that downtime where you sit in pre-development, you've got all those things that happen, and oh, I'm excited about this side, oh, I'm excited about that one. But here at Scooters, we're going to make sure that you have different touch points along the way. So I'm really excited because there is a franchising onboarding consultant. So that's different from a franchise business consultant. The onboarding consultant is going to help you like throughout that process where it can seem a little daunting. The business hasn't opened. You know what it's going to look like, but you're not able to do it yet because you're finding that that particular space that you're going to either ground purchase, land purchase, or you're going to sign a lease on, right? There's so many options out there for it. But then after you get through that process, now we've signed a lease. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to have you come to owner immersion. You're going to spend three days with us, and we're really going to take you through what does it mean to be a franchise owner at Scooters, right? So it's a little more high level. You're just getting your, your toes dipped into the water. You know you're going to open an operation up, right? Then once you get through that, now we get closer to when your store is getting, like, we've broken ground. Construction is happening. It's exciting. All of that is amazing, but guess what we're going to do? We're going to take the owner and we're going to ask that you identify who your operator is and we're going to put you through training. And it's not just a week of training. No, no. It's two to four weeks of training depending on your position in, inside the ownership structure, right? So if you're an owner, it's a minimum of two weeks. If you're the manager, it's four weeks. So our dedication to training is incredible. And that's, I think, is that's really what's going to bring the Scooters Coffee to life the values, the consistency, the brand standards, all of that, you can't get away from it when you've lived in it for four straight weeks. And then on top of that, we're going to send a training team out to you when you get ready to open the store. So you once again have support because listen, you probably open a restaurant, a QSR, whatever you've done, I've done the same. And it can be overwhelming. That last push, it's like a blur when you look back on how did this ever get open? <laughs> I don't actually remember all of the days. They just kind of rolled together. But there's really a lot of structure inside of that. And, and we know you need a partner. Our owners need a partner when they go through that process. And I'll tell you, our best owners are those that really, they decide after opening that first one, they've either signed a multi-unit agreement or they've signed a single agreement. They come out of that experience and they, they really are just so dedicated to the business that they want to do more. So that's really, I think, what's going to fuel our growth. But again, I just mentioned the dedication to the training process. I haven't seen anything like this in a franchising organization, and I've been in franchising for a minute. Mm. So just that dedicate and, and making sure that the owners know up front, this is what is going to happen. Like, we don't, we don't trade on this. This is where... Remember we talked about operating process before and standard operating procedures. I would refer to this as the training standard operating procedures. Right. And there's a lot on the line, especially in recent years. There's a lot of competition, not mm -hmm. just from corporate entities, but from independent coffee shops. There's a lot, you know, in major cities, when you go to even in the Midwest, in the middle of the country, you know, when I started in coffee, it was 1999. And, you know, if you were in the Midwest and you found espresso, I mean, you struck gold. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally mm -hmm. just, you know, passable espresso. Now, these days, obviously, it's a lot more saturated. And therefore, it's obvious why this kind of a, a focus on onboarding and training, because you've got a lot more of a rich landscape. How does Scooters perceive and compete with that landscape in terms of people who are in the same city, you know, sometimes there's not a lot of space to be had in some of these major thoroughfares. So you might have like five coffee shops within a you know certain, maybe even four or five miles of each other. So what does that look like in terms of how you train operators or even how you go about selecting locations that are good opportunities to expand to? Yeah, there's a lot of, I think uh, I would call it art and science that goes into selecting the right space. Certainly, it's going to all be about visibility, right? We want to make sure that we're visible. I don't know that, I mean, listen, A corners are great. I think A plus corners, but there's a lot of A plus real estate that's somewhere you haven't thought of. And it's just making sure that we're all defining that in the same way. And that can vary depending on where you're at, right? So you think of main thoroughfares. I also think, hey, what's near a school? What's near a high school, right? Or a community as they're coming out and going to work. So there's both bedroom communities. There's larger communities, right? There's master communities. There's a lot of places to still go 
where we're able to capture that coffee customer. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And that's just based on maybe it's like look-see, right. but it's also, it's before the place is open. It's going out and scouting locations and saying, okay, well, this corner is great, but you know, the intersection is so crammed that people aren't going to turn right to go into this space. You know, they just, they don't right. want to. So that's the art of it or the psychology of it, right? Do you have people that go out there and you could have so many applications for franchise out there, but they're not all the right opportunities. So is it a matter of just examining and saying like, we like you, but <laughs> the, the space is, yeah, we can't say yes to the space. And that's kind of like a constraint right now. We have a lot of our owners that come in that um, we've thought about where they're at and that's an area we want to develop, but we haven't maybe dialed it into, well, where are we looking? So we we might define a space or we might define a community space or, right, not necessarily even a metro area. I would almost even say like territory. So we're looking through that. And what we're really trying to think about, Chris, is, but where is it that people are coming out and we're on the going to work side for them because it, you kind of nailed it when you said you make right-hand turns. We don't want people going against traffic and making left-hand turns because that makes everybody miserable. Nobody's going to want to stop and get coffee from you. That is not considered convenient on the way to work. Yeah, that's right. And so you put yourself in the place of the customer and say what's valuable to them in this particular moment. That's right. And that's different for drive throughs whether you're operating a scooters or just a drive through single kiosk than it would be if you're walking into a brick and mortar. And so you've got to think about how to apply empathy to your potential customers. And then you have your own value proposition, I suppose, versus other brands that you're competing against for market share. How do you coach people who are leading? They might get baristas working for them that come from independent coffee shops or the like. And so when you have a market that might already be, have a coffee culture, how does Scooters go in there and create market share with their unique value proposition? You know, it's all about ensuring that you love the brand and you love our beverages. And I'll tell you, we don't necessarily go after those that have come from other coffee chains, right? Or an independent chain or anything else. We, we are interested in people that are interested in doing hard work and by the way, you need to be interviewing these people at like 5 a.m. Like, are they really going to wake up and come in and see you? <laughs> because if they bail and they can't show up for the 5 a.m. time frame, likely you're not going to have that morning peak staff, right? Yeah, that's so a great point. make sure that you know that who they are. But we'll take anybody from all walks of life because at the end of the day, the training is so strong and we believe in our product. Our coffee is delicious. Our products are delicious. And so once we show you that it, this can all be done fast and this can be done at peak, it really just wins people that are looking for employment over. And they want to have that consistent structure. They want to know they can come in and out at certain times. And we're just really fortunate that we change people into turn. I'm amazed at our owners and what they are able to do. But they turn people from right being at, no, I only want to work maybe 8 to 4 into, no, I want to be here at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning because it's such an energetic pace. You're really working hard. And, and honestly, most baristas will tell you by the time they look down at their watch, they're amazed. What do you mean it's 10.30? Where did that time go? I didn't even realize it. And that is a value to people. A lot of what our owners will share with us is that, Listen, this is a tough work environment. I'm sure you've heard that from other people that have been on your podcast. And so it's really making sure what people are judging you, you on is what's the culture of an organization. Then they're going to judge on what's the training like, right? If they show up for training, and by the way, in some cases, I know for a fact they actually have accepted three or four jobs. And they're testing out different, like who's got the better training and who's going to treat me the best. And then they'll drop the others, literally ghost them, and then stay with the owner that they like, who's at Scooters usually, and they'll stay with us. And then we're able to really just show them how to get the job done. I love the point you made there. Interviewing people at 5 a.m. And it's not sadistic, it's just realistic, right? And <laughs> that's right. The idea is that you want to, and we tell people this on the show, we just everyone's a professional interviewer and an interviewee because we've got hacks, we've got videos we can watch and we can ace it. But we really want to see who people are because that's who they're going to be when the chips are down and it's really busy. It's not a lack of having a 
hard shift because hard is is relative you know it's hard but it's rewarding that's fine you know we, people do that all the time when we talk about barista competitions barista competitions are hard to do tasks that we take on to challenge ourselves are hard but it's just a matter of who you're doing it with how the environment is and what the culture is and so i like that that's kind of the focal point that y'all have when it comes to the challenges that coffee shop owners in general face one of the main things we hear so much about is cost of goods and supply chain issues and just how we have to raise our price. I've got so many clients that have raised their prices because we just have to, which is fine. But when you're expanding, how do you account for the increased cost of goods? I mean, it doesn't feel like a time to say, hey, let's go and open more stores, but things are more and more expensive. How does this get managed on Scooter's end? So Scooters is very fortunate. We have a vertically integrated supply chain called Harvest Roasting. So we actually roast all of our coffee in-house. Much of the baked goods that we have that we sell are made in-house. And then in each situation, it's delivered by Harvest Roasting. Actually, we usually put out every single week. It's funny you're asking me this because every single week we put out communication to our system called the weekly brew. And we always ask for people to share their pictures and their stories with us because we start off with recognition. So it's always celebrating success right out of the gate. And then we go into the different points that we're going to mention for the week. And this week, a uh, delivery driver from Harvest Roasting was celebrated with a barista team because they love him so much. And he's their regular weekly delivery driver. He's part of their Scooters family for the different locations that he visits. And they wanted to make sure that he got recognized this week. So we're really fortunate that we have this vertically integrated supply chain. That is what is making the difference for us. And to your point, COGS will continue to rise. There is inflation. That is just a fact of life that we're going through right now. I would say the biggest pressure that we're facing is actually like much of the country in terms of dairy costs. We've all seen the cost of milk just go through the roof. We've also seen eggs. Not that we purchase those, but we do see like, again, anything in that sector is something that's we're staying very close to and really looking to how do we manage and what's our future strategic approach to it. Right. And so that begs the question when it comes to the simplicity of your menu and how you edit that and you have exercised some control over that where it's not like, no, we've opened that up to customization so much that we can't really take things away, et cetera. Do you find that the menu is the place where you need to make adjustments, obviously on price of what you're charging in the stores, but also in the menu items that you do let franchisees put on their menu based on the costs that you're having to absorb is are those levers that you're pulling to kind of control these even though you have your own vertically integrated supply chain so last year there were two small price increases that were taken or recommended to franchisees and that really seemed to do the trick this year we're not giving guidance on taking price but to your point what we continuously look at and we're very good at managing and paying attention to is what the cost of good is on each single product. And so it's really starting to think about as an organization, when we bring forward products, making sure that it matches through a number of stress tests. I mentioned the first being speed. <laughs> that's really important to us because if it's something that's outside of the recipe standard that we do for the other beverages, then that's some, or it's got one too many ingredients or you're bringing in ingredients that we're not currently using, that's something that we're going to push back on. I mean, operations and marketing and culinary, we all have a relationship together, but it should be a relationship that occasionally is tense, uh, yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. right? Where I'm taking the side of pushing for the, the franchisee to make sure that that profit margin is there and that speed is there. Culinary may be pushing, yes, but it's delicious and it's amazing. And hey, nine ingredients makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> so I don't think so, but they might think so. And then you've got marketing going, yes, I might be able to do all of these different things with it. And so it's all about coming into a room. And the one thing I'd say about scooters is how collaborative the environment is. So internally, as a franchisor, the way we function, it's very collaborative. We're really focused on making sure that a franchisee continues to have that profitable margin for every single beverage that they have. Right. And there's menu items that are just going to be more profitable. What would be the mainstay like, hey, you know, 
don't worry, like these are your profit leaders at a scooters versus some other things that are there, obviously as a, I wouldn't say filler, but they balance out the menu, they attract people. But what are the main things that people count on? Espresso-based beverages are key. That's where you're going to find a lot of your profit margin. Mm. I mean, in the course of a day, one of the things that, you know, now that we're talking about cost of goods, it's also waste. Waste is huge. And I'd love to know a little bit about how a company your size goes about mitigating waste when it comes to costs. And so we don't see that profit disappearing into the ether. Like, I don't know why we're not making money, but our baristas are throwing shots out willy nilly. I don't know. So how does that work to control waste within a franchise? We say, again, it goes back to making sure that when we're there for those visits, the scheduled brand standards visits, that we're all staying really focused on recipe standards. Because a lot of places where you can get away from things is if you're moving too fast and you're just dumping milk, right, um, into a pitcher and you're not really looking at the inside of it that has all the measured increments <laughs> yeah. for you, again, there's such a thing as going too fast, right, or being a little bit sloppy with it. And so how do we make sure that we're really honing those skills and that the owner is really, and also the store manager, they're really focused on and hyper-focused on how do we continue to drive it? Because this isn't about being sloppy, right? I don't want a sloppy cup. You don't either. If not, then it kind of goes back to our earlier discussion. You're not going to necessarily trust that beverage to be great every time you get it. Because if somebody's sloppy with it or someone's not following the recipe standard, you're going to notice it in the taste profile when you get the beverage. I mean, you you know as well as I do, and our customers do too, they can tell when it's spot mm -hmm. on to their taste profile and what they know about that beverage versus it's something's not quite right. Not sure what it is, but something's not quite right. So again, it's focusing on those brand standards every single visit that we're together and making sure it's part of our core conversation with our franchisees. Lovely. Yes. I really appreciate that last sentiment about, you know, customer's taste profile and where a lot of us in the third wave specialty independent landscape will kind of show some of that I don't, it's a trope, I guess. The snobby, you know, barista who is like, well, you just don't understand coffee, you know, if you don't <laughs> like what I like. And we talk about it a lot within the community. But the idea that the customer has a, a finely attuned sense of what is right is probably the first step to be able to respect them as, you know, somebody whom you're actually serving, right? And not just somebody who is there to be educated by you, although that will happen, is they're there to be served by you. That's exactly right. We, we want customer satisfaction. I am really thrilled to, again, have this time to sit down with you. I really appreciate all you've shared. And I have just kind of a final question to round out our, our chat today. And that is the core values of scooters, their integrity, love, humility, and courage. And I'm curious about how operationally you and others in upper administration disseminate those values systematically and relationally to make sure that, you know, somebody who is working somewhere in the Midwest at a scooters is feeling those things in the day to day. That's a great question. You know, our brand promise also reflects our core values, right? So it's amazing people, amazing drinks, amazingly fast. And when we go into stores, we focus on the amazing walk. And that's, again, our, our core brand standards walk that we're going to look at. But I'll tell you, the core values that we have are part of everything we do, whether it's my team showing up and having a store visit. But boy, our owners and our store managers, they really make our baristas feel special. And I think it's just part of that piece that we have inside of the, this particular business where you just see that culture reflected all of the time. Don talks about our core values. We give examples to each of the core values. And it, I, I think I mentioned it before, but we do a weekly communication where we ask for our baristas and our store managers and those out in the field share with us someone that you would like to recognize and or a group of people that follows one of these values. And that's where I was sharing with you earlier that we actually had a delivery driver featured, yeah. right, in our last weekly brew. And, and they were actually sharing 
the love that they have for him, that he is out there, like he's driving like early, early in the morning to get to them and deliver everything and help them put everything up and be a part of their day and the, how much they just loved having him around. So it's really reflected back to us in so many different ways. We feed it out to the system and they feed it back to us. So it really is this very natural piece of the, the culture inside of Spooter's Coffee that just makes it great to work here. Talking about amazing people and people that are doing a great job in working together to make these experiences happen for the customers. And there's also you know, a level of care that has to be taken, not just to create the culture of being a part of a team that's doing great things and amazing yourself with like, wow, I can't believe we did that. Like you mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, it's also the compensation. It's also the idea of being able to regularly count on a company that gives you a good schedule or gives you a fair wage and what that structure looks like. How do scooters go about tracking that kind of thing and making sure that not only is the culture up to snuff, but the systems that actually monetarily support the people that work so hard is also on the same level? That's a great question. You know, what we do encourage our franchisees to do is actually talk to each other. Right. So if you're in a particular market and you're really struggling to get people, we basically play. You remember the game as a kid where you play connection? Oh, yeah. Um, our job is to connect one owner to another owner to another owner, A, to share best practices, because sometimes it could be the culture, right? Maybe it's a different piece that they need to consider, not necessarily the pay, right? So how do they set up the benefits in totality versus what is the actual pay rate? And the other thing that as a, as a franchisor that we like to do is make sure that one of the things we're focused on is in our app, right? Are we looking at things like tips where there's, hey, there's your base salary, but then there's, you know, we want an owner to be able to share, hey, but then there's also the tips and then whatever else the owner might offer, right? So we look for things we can do as a franchisor, but then we also look to make sure we play that connection game where we're really connecting either new owners into the system or maybe owners that have been around, but they're seeing those labor rates go up, those average hourly rates go up in their areas, and they're not quite sure how to handle that. And so we really want to make sure that we're connecting them to each other, because I'll tell you, that's where the magic's going to happen is when they share with each other. And again, it goes back to that, what we talked about earlier, it's problem solving. But in this case, we're encouraging them to problem solve with each other. So Jamie, this has really been Fantastic. Again, thank you for your time. Where can people stay in touch and how can we learn more about scooters? Oh, please follow us on LinkedIn. Please look for us online. We're so excited about our growth opportunity and the trajectory that our business is going. So just stay focused. There's so much happening in our business. I have no doubt there's too many opportunities for you to find us. <laughs> Excellent. Again, wonderful to talk with you and I uh, really appreciate your time and sharing your wisdom and experiences with us. Excellent. Thank you. There's one thing that I really feel is so important to pull away from this conversation. And that is the idea of training. It is the idea of investigating, as Jamie talked about, you know, going to see what's happening on the floor and you know, creating solutions for problems that are observed and making them systematic solutions. The idea that they put so much effort into training people to make sure that they're going to embody the kind of character traits and behaviors that they want to see at these locations. It's obviously something that with their company with scooters is they're willing to put a lot of money into and certainly when we're talking about a company that size that's not cheap but they believe in their values to the extent that they're willing to put that kind of money into training because they see how it translates to the final product ultimately the experience within that building for the customers that go through those drive-throughs and that's where their attention is. And even to the degree of you know having this quarterback role that Jamie talked about, where you're going to be like trying to fine tune the operations. That's the passion is really focusing on how to make it better and better so that as you grow, you can remain consistent with the product that you put out that your customers have come to know and love. And whether you have 613 locations or six or one. It doesn't matter. 
you could benefit from putting into practice the same kind of philosophy as they have. And so big thank you to Jamie Denny for joining us on the show. As you said, if you want to stay up to date with what's going on, you can just look up Scooters on LinkedIn, follow them on LinkedIn. And of course, you can always check them out over at ScootersCoffee.com. Again, thank you very much, Jamie, for your time and sharing your experiences with us. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about today's episode, and you want to reach out and ask, then feel free. I mean, my email is chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. That's also where you can reach out if you're interested in working with me one-on-one to, for coaching and consultation with Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, I want to make mention today that the next shows coming up for Coffee Fest are in Louisville, Kentucky, then also in Anaheim, California, and Orlando, Florida. So you have plenty of opportunity to look at what's coming around the bend in terms of the great educational materials, the free or accessibly priced trainings, workshops, lectures. You've got uh, panel discussions, all sorts of opportunities to learn and resourced and equipped for success. Competitions like the Coffee Fest Latte Art World Championship Open, There's the trade show floor at Coffee Fest where you get to interact with vendors from a range of different services and products and get just firsthand experience with them and ask your questions there. And of course, you've got lots of people who are also coffee people, hungry for knowledge, and there's such a great energy and camaraderie there. The community makes it all worth it. So check out coffeefest.com for more information to get yourself and your team signed up today. And you can get 50% off your registration when you use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S. Use the code KEYS, get 50% off your registration, coffeefest.com. I'll be at all of these shows, judging latte art, giving presentations, have a little booth, So please do say hello. Again, check them out over at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn more about scooters, about speed, about applying values operationally with our guest, Jamie Denny. It really was a great time. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, share the episodes with your friends. Have an awesome day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.